Good afternoon. My name is Leslie Hitchens and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Law. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you at today's webinar with our special guest, Dominic Woolrich. Before we go further, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, upon whose ancestral lands the UTS City Campus now stands. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. Today's webinar is brought to you as part of a webinar series, UTS Illuminated, and it celebrates the achievement of successful alumni like Dominic, who've been recognized as the 2020 UTS Alumni Award recipients. So welcome to all of you who are joining us today. And before we begin, there's a few things that I'd just like to run through with you. This webinar is being recorded. The format for today is a 30 minute discussion with Dominic, and then we'll use the remaining time for questions and discussion from the audience. We welcome your questions during today's presentation. So please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. Thank you to those of you who've already submitted questions when registering and we'll endeavor to get to as many questions as possible. Now, to the reason that we're all here today, let me introduce and tell you a little bit about Dominic. Dominic is a graduate of UTS, both in the Law Faculty and the Faculty of Business. He holds a Bachelor of Business and a Juris Doctor at UTS. He undertook a clerkship at Minter Ellison Lawyers. He interned at the International Court of Justice, and he worked as a lawyer in criminal matters at the Public Interest Advocacy Centre. He also, bringing in, I guess, his uh, business expertise, he also founded an on-demand training group, training workers across well-known rideshare platforms in over 15 cities. His appetite for combining um, entrepreneurship and the law didn't stop there. Dominic went on to uh, help establish the Startup Law Path. And it's now Australia's largest and fastest growing online legal platform and recognized as one of the top 10 legal startups in Australia and the top 50 in the world. So Law Path has really reshaped the legal profession. It's enabled legal practitioners to participate in the gig economy, and it's helped over 130,000 Australian businesses access legal services at a fraction of the time, cost, and complexity of traditional ways of lawyering. In addition to his role as CEO of Law Path, I'm pleased to say that he is also an honorary professional fellow with the UTS Law Faculty, and he's also a founding member of the Australian Legal Technology, Technology Association. So with his long list of accomplishments, he's a very worthy recipient of the 2020 UTS Law Alumni Award. Dominic, congratulations and welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, what a great and very long introduction. It's, uh, <laughs> it's good to hear about everything I've achieved over the last few years. <laughs> great. Um, well, my particular ple pleasure at, at you being our Alumni Award winner to this year and also us being able to talk today is that law and technology is an interest that I've had in my role as Dean um, at UTS and, and how that's shaping and reshaping legal practice and what that means for us educating the future generation of lawyers. And so to start off, um, 
I mean, you've obviously, as I've just been reading out, Dominic, have, have really, you know, been involved for quite some time in this area. So how would you, what would you say innovation in legal practice looked like when you first started out? And, and how have you seen your original ideas change? Yeah, so, I mean, I've, uh, I graduated in, in 2011, so it actually wasn't that long ago no. uh, that, I, that I finished university. However, um, legal tech or, or legal innovation has gone through this huge shift over the last five years. Um, you know, I think, I want, I think one of the, the, the quotes going around at the moment is the legal industry has changed in, more in the last five years than it has in the last 50. So a lot has changed. And I, I think that when we first kind of came up with the concept of law path, um, we, we looked out into the legal profession and we saw that there was, you know, the legal profession is, is doing a great job, $25 billion a year in Australia. But, but we looked at some of the statistics and, that said things like, 87% of small businesses can't access the legal services they need or 80% of individuals can't access the legal services they need. So there's definitely this access to justice, access to legal services issue still around. And um, we looked and we said, how can we change that? Um, and I think the, the, the big kind of aha moment at that time was that the technology was starting to catch up and, and the legal industry was starting to accept and say, we need to go through this shift as well. I think the legal industry is probably the last professional services industry to be touched by technology. We saw the accountants go through it about 10 years ago. We saw software such as Xero and Reckon and QuickBooks come through and totally change the accounting industry. And I think it's, it's legal's time now. So I, I do have a bit of a confession to make. When, when we first started the company, the idea was to replace lawyers. <laughs> and a lot of lawyers really hate to hear that. Um, the good news is that as we've kind of gone through this journey, we've realised that that's not the goal anymore. You'll, you'll never replace lawyers. They're, they're such an important part of the legal industry. Mm -hmm. However, I think we will really change the way that lawyers work and the way that clients engage with the law. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we first started, we had a couple of ideas. I, I think the first one was how do we bring the cost down and how do we bring the access up? Mm -hmm. And so in terms of cost, that was, a, that was a pretty easy one. It was, how do we use more software and more technology um, to essentially bring down the hours that lawyers needed to spend on matters, which therefore would bring down the cost. The other one was about access. And that was, you know, how do we, how do we take law online um, and how do we make it accessible from any device at any time? Especially small businesses, which is, the play, is where LawPath plays, you know, they expect to do their accounting online, their banking online, their insurance online. Why shouldn't they also have their, their legal services online as well? Mm -hmm. So we took those two concepts and, and since then it's really been iterations. So what LawPath is today is, as you mentioned in your very kind introduction, is Australia's largest online platform for small businesses and individuals. It's really a one-stop shop where they can come and access legal tools or software to help them perform legal tasks, or if they can't do it themselves, it helps them connect in with a lawyer. So we really looked at um, kind of three main areas. The first was document automation. Um, document automation has changed so much in the last five years. And, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of lawyers, they didn't go to uni to draft documents. Mm. They went to uni to advise clients, to, to sit in meeting rooms with clients and, and actually solve problems, not sit in a dark room and, and draft boring legal documents. So technology is a perfect um, area that you can focus on, on legal documentation. And so we partnered with LexisNexis, who I'm sure everyone's pretty across. And um, we, we took their, um, the, some of their software and some of their precedents, and we built a document automation system for small businesses that everyone could understand. And Really, that's kind of iterated now to a point where it's got not just document automation, but the ability to collaborate with lawyers, with other people in your business. You can add on e-signature, which has become a really, really um, booming area, especially since, since COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of an end-to-end -end management system, which is very popular and legal today. The other two areas um, that have kind of gone through a, a large shift is this idea of connecting a client to a lawyer. So... Traditionally, if you were if you're going to find a lawyer, especially in the small business or, or mid law space, you would probably ask a friend, or you'd ask a colleague, or you'd go up to your local high street and you'd look for the sign that says lawyer. 
And that's a really, really bad way of finding a lawyer. So, um, you know, if you take that, that process online, um, if you take that process to kind of almost like a marketplace where lawyers can bid and compete for your work, it means you're, you're getting the best, the best deal. Mm -hmm. um, and just to kind of, kind of finish that circle, so document automation, the ability to connect with a lawyer. And the last one was this ability to start a business. Starting a business in Australia was really complicated. You had to go to lots of different government agencies and, and you'd had to do things at certain times and set up your tax. And so we thought, how can we put that kind of all together in, in one seamless process? So, you know, we took those three ideas and put them into one platform. And, um, it, you know, it became this one-stop shop for, for your legals online. And the last four or five years has just been around iterating on that and, and making it better and adding in new features. To the point now, as you mentioned, you know, 150, we're up to 150,000 um, users now. Um, they're coming to us, you know, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, sometimes only once a year to solve those little legal issues or legal problems that they traditionally just wouldn't get solved. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, you know, I think what's so interesting is um, when you, you said when you started off and you confess, we thought, you know, you thought you'd replace lawyers. But actually, I, I do think the interesting thing about technology is that it's actually really making us have to think, you know, at first there was this, well, we can get rid of lawyers or, you know, why do we need all these lawyers, etc. But actually, I think it's, it's, it's helping us to really think through, well, what, what is the important role of a lawyer? And as you say, it's not sitting there drafting or checking documents or something like that, but there's a whole range of other skills that can, you know, judgment, ethics, all of those sorts of things that can come in, into play. So it's, it's interesting that it's that something that might have seen as a threat to lawyers um, it actually has to make us think more carefully about what a lawyer does and to value that um, and, and to be more efficient about some of the things that, that were being done um, in practice. Yeah, it's, it's actually really, it's a really interesting concept. And we've, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, the, this idea of the unbundling of legal services. Mm. So, um, you know, do you need a lawyer to do the complete end-to-end -end yeah. service when a client come, comes to a lawyer. Mm -hmm. No, you, you don't, you know, you can unbundle those legal services and software can do part of it. Mm -hmm. Non-lawyers can do part of it, you know, offshore can do part of it. And you just let the lawyers or the legal professionals focus on the area that they mm -hmm. are specifically trained to do. Mm -hmm. And usually when you ask lawyers, it's that it's those areas that they actually want to focus on yeah. instead of all these other areas that can be done um, mm -hmm. by, by non-lawyers. So this idea of unbundling, I think, will become bigger and bigger. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people talk about legal tech and it's very much a buzzword these days. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important to remember that it's not just about the technology. It's mm -hmm. about the process and the changing of business models. It, it kind of I think legal tech is the sexy word that everyone talks about, mm -hmm. but it's bigger than that. Um, and it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, and and some of that I'd like to return to. Uh, given that we're into twenty, and in fact, rather than having a, a wonderful alumni dinner as we would normally have in an awards event, uh, you're at home and I'm in my office, and we're having this webinar. Which um, so COVID nineteen has of course changed the way we might normally celebrate your alumni award, but. I'm interested for a firm like yours that was already working in a different way to the traditional law firm, has COVID changed anything that you do or, or has it had an impact on the way that you work? Yeah, de definitely. I think from, from an internal perspective, uh, you know, we, we are a, a software company. We call ourselves a software company. We, we say that we're remote first, meaning that, you know, we, we should be able to work from anywhere. Um, we're totally cloud-based. Um, you know, when COVID hit back in March, we all went home. Um, mm -hmm. Now we have a, an optional work from home model. So you can choose to come into the office or not. Um, and I've actually just put in place that kind of permanently moving forward, COVID or not. Um, and I think a lot of businesses have found that now. It's, it's COVID's kind of shocked them into this work from home scenario, but they've actually realized that, yeah, it, it, it works really well. And, and some employees... Um, really love the ability to have a little bit more freedom and being at home. So, so internally, um, there wasn't too much of a shift for us. Um, you know, we're a team of 40, so it wasn't like we had to move hundreds of people back home. 
Um, one of the big areas that I think has we've had to put a lot of focus into is around kind of team engagement and, and culture because you do that's the one thing you do really lose when you go home. Um, you know, sit, sitting sitting here in, in my living room, there's you know there's no interactions and. What I've found is that business as usual can go on um, quite well. You know, everyone's already trained up and the tasks that they were going to do, but those those leaps and bounds that a company makes, which requires collaboration, that's a lot harder. You know, it's often um, it's not often not in the actual meeting that you make the biggest progress. It's it's when you're walking out of the meeting room and you're having a quick chat to someone, or you're walking down the hall and you're saying, "I'm working on this project. You're working on this project. Why don't we get together?" That's that's had a bit of an effect. So, working hard on that um, externally um, for the business. I mean, COVID's been not a good result at all um, for, the, for the rest of the world. But from our point of view and our business model, it's actually been a, a huge acceleration. Mm. Um, just because our business model is essentially set up um, for these this type of environment, people working from home, people working online. Um, I, I put it down to two kind of main drivers. One is uh, clients are looking for alternative legal solutions um, because they can't access their traditional legal solutions. Mm -hmm. So maybe they used to work with a smaller firm that isn't in the office anymore and not as responsive, yeah. or they're working with a larger firm that just can't take on additional capacity right now. Mm -hmm. The other reason I'm seeing or we're seeing demand from is it's just been a bit of a time for people to reassess their legal and, and who they've been using. They might have been using the same firm for 10 years and they're trying to pinch pennies a little bit and looking for a cheaper solution. And that's when they're starting to look at these new models and these online models, which are a lot cheaper. Um, and yes, potentially you're going to have to do a little bit of more of the work yourself or you might have to, you know, in our case, start creating a document through our software and then refer it off to a lawyer. Whereas traditionally you just give the whole thing to a lawyer and say, can you run with it? So big, big change kind of in for, for law path. And then I suppose, um, you know, what we're seeing in the industry as well is that, um, you know, I, you know, remote lawyering or, or working from home or lawyers working from home, especially freelance lawyers, um, that we've seen a huge increase there. So through our marketplace, we've seen a lot more employment type work coming through, a lot more property type work coming through. And people don't mind where the lawyer is anymore. You know, they're not expecting to, to have a face-to-face -face consultation. They're not expecting to go up to a nice client floor and, and meet with the partners. They're, they're expecting a Zoom call, just like we're on today. And so that's changed. And so what, what we've seen there is that clients are working with lawyers all over Australia. You know, and that's what I love to see. I love it when a client in Sydney is working with uh, a lawyer in Byron Bay or a client in Brisbane is working with a lawyer in Perth because um, traditionally those lawyers wouldn't have access to those type of clients. But because we're all online now and because this is just the status quo, it, it, it works fine. Yeah, that's great. And I suppose when COVID started, we, were all, we all thought it was just going to be for a, a few months or so. But in fact, we're now realising we're in this situation, perhaps not as bad as when it initially in us started, but this is all going to go on for quite a while. We're not just going to all flood back to our offices and, and so forth. And do you have a sense of how, um, you know, as you were saying, you were kind of well-placed to, to adapt, but do you have a sense of how um, other firms, um, perhaps particularly the small to medium what situation they might be and, and whether, how it's going to impact them for the future. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think when it, when it first started, we definitely saw a lot of the smaller firms struggling. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of software to run your, your practice online for a long time. Um, mm. And this has just accelerated the need for that. So especially around practice management systems and things like that. If you didn't have one before COVID, you 100% have one now because you need those tools. I think what we've we've seen a lot from our um, marketplace firms, so these are the small firms that work through our platform, is that it's not specifically legal tools that they've been inquiring about. It's it's just general business tools. So, you know, the, the easy one to go to is, is Zoom, which we're on right now, um, you know, firms that didn't have any kind of video soft software set up, you know, instantly day one had video software set up. But now we're seeing a lot of firms using um, kind of like task tracking software and, and, and that type of stuff um, and, and coming to us and asking for kind of guidance on, on what to use. 
We're also seeing a lot of firms starting to spend more on advertising, on online advertising, because the traditional methods aren't, or the offline methods aren't working anymore. So I, I would, I'm very optimistic. I think most firms have adapted now um, and they've been given a couple of months now to realize that this is how it will be for, for the next little while. I think um, some of the, the really exciting things to come out of this are some of the changes we've seen around actual rules and regulations that have changed. So, you know, the most exciting one for me is this idea around online witnessing and, and e-signatures. So e-signatures have been, um, actually Australia is one of the first countries to, to legalize e-signatures. However, they didn't really pick up as quickly as we, we wanted them to. Um, that being said, e-signatures now is, is booming. You know, I would, um, most of the documents going through LawPath, whether it's using LawPath e-sign, which is our own e-sign feature or an external one are being done electronically. The big one for me though was um, online witnessing. So when, when Corona first hit, we had a lot of clients coming to us and making wills. Um, and what we were finding is that, that they couldn't get these wills witnessed. So they were creating the will, they were having a lawyer review the will, but they were stuck at home and they needed two witnesses. So luckily, I, as you may be aware, all the, the state law societies and um, essentially changed the rules to, to allow for video witnessing, which now allows you to witness a will, witness a D, witness a stat deck um, online, which has been a, a real game changer um, for those type of, of services. And they've um, just last week extended that now until um, halfway through March 2021. And I would make a prediction that says potentially it could be a permanent change. Yes. Yeah. And, and so interesting how as, as COVID in so many ways has shown us when if we, if there's a need, an emergency, we can switch so quickly. And, and then you start to think, well, why don't we do this all the time like this and so forth? Exactly, exactly right. I think, um, yeah, this is the perfect, well, there were all these fears around, um, you know, can we do online witnessing? Can we, do we know who's doing the actual witnessing? And, and COVID's forced us to do it. And now we've seen that it's actually a, a, a fantastic solution. I was actually really impressed with the way that most of the states implemented it because they didn't go as far as saying you can witness by electronic signature, which I think was a step too far. They've said you can do, you still need to do a physical signature on paper, but you can do it via video. And so, um, yeah, I think that's really important. You know, there's a reason that these regulations and rules take so long to get through. They need to be tried and tested. And so knee jerk decisions when COVID hit um, uh, were not, you know, were not a good idea. So they, they went halfway, which solved the problem. And I, I think that's a really good place. Um, and now we can keep advocating for the final solution, which I believe will be totally online, but there's a lot of checks and balances that we need to meet before we get there. Yeah. yeah. And so given the way, as you're suggesting, a number of firms are beginning to adapt and so forth, does that, um, does that pose a competitive threat to you, to law path post? Um, uh, the, the more the merrier. Um, you know, I think the, um, if you, you know, I kind of look at this as like competition or collaboration. I'm, I'm very much still in the collaboration stage. Um, the reason being is that, you know, legal tech is still a, a small percentage of, of legal. You know, 2% of, of global legal spend is legal technology. So we're starting from a really small base. Um, that being said, you know, legal technology investment went up just over 700% last year. So it's it's definitely a, a very fast growing area of the law. However, it's still a really low baseline. So no, in terms of competition, I think the more people, the more firms, the more lawyers that are embracing technology, moving online um, is, is better for everyone. And, you know, I definitely think there's been a shift over the last probably 24 to 36 months around this idea, is technology coming to take my job or is technology coming to help me do my job? And it really depends how you look at it, but luckily, and I think definitely for the better, most lawyers are saying technology and process change and changing business models is here, not not to change, not to, not to take my job away from me, but just to make it better. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And and you're right in a sense when you you know it, it is a reminder when you think that Law Path has only been going five years, and really that that does mark this period of of technology and and. And it was felt very new at that point, and we weren't quite sure what it looked like, but we are gradually getting the sense that it is, as you say, it's not something about taking a job, but about how we support it and, and so forth. And 
And I suppose on that, I mean, obviously you've been an innovator. Law Path is, is an innovative way of delivering legal services and, and particularly around access. And I'm wondering, um, you know, across perhaps the legal profession or other parts of the legal profession, how do you think that they're traveling with technology? I mean, do you think that there are, are limits or, I mean, you have a certain number of certain principles that, that shape the way law path operates. For example, it is about access, it's about creating, making it easier for people to access services cheaply, quickly, find them and so forth. Does there have to be a kind of cultural shift, if you like, um, for other parts of the legal profession to really adapt in the way that perhaps law path has or to find their own path with yeah. technology? <laughs> Yeah, so it's yeah, it's a really good question because I think sometimes I feel like I'm stuck in my own little legal technology bubble where you know we we are on the cutting edge and you know because that's the business model and and you forget that there are 74,000 other lawyers out there in Australia that potentially um, aren't using um, as much software as us. That being said, I definitely think the, the legal profession has come a long way, um, especially small law. You know, there's a lot of solo practitioners out there, but the, they've actually been forced to use technology because they don't have the support of a large firm. You know, there's there's definitely this this idea recently over the last few years of of lawyers moving away from large firms and starting their own boutique practices. And one of the reasons that they can do that is that there are all these fantastic tools that a boutique or or even a you know, one or two principal law firm can use. You know, they, they don't need a full-time accountant anymore. They can pay $50 subscription and have a zero subscription. They don't need a library or a librarian. They can sign up to a LexisNexis subscription and have everything there to, to access. So I think the, the definitely the small law are using more and more software. I think also what we're seeing is that clients are now demanding that, that, that lawyers use this type of software. The, the pressure is coming from the client side. And, you know, I definitely think that the, the legal profession on a whole has for a very, very long time held this, well, this is the way that we practice law. And of course, we're not going to use electronic signature. You're coming to our office to, 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 to wet sign these documents and we're going to charge you hourly. But now clients are turning around and saying, well, no, like that's not the kind of service I get in other prof professional industries. And the lawyer I used last year didn't do that. And so I would like to do it on Zoom and I would like to e-sign these documents. And we're, we're not just seeing that at the, the lower end of the profession. Um, we're seeing that all the way through up into the high end where, um, you know, especially around billing practices, um, going a little outside of technology here, but, you know, fixed fee billing or, or stage billing, you know, hourly billing is, is, you know, getting lower and lower and lower at every, every level. Um, you know what I kind of call it the final frontier, which which is litigation. So I like that's kind of my benchmark. If if litigation is um, or, or barristers are using uh, software and technology, then um, then I think the legal profession is doing a really good job. And and you know we're seeing software like eBrief out of Victoria, uh, where where barristers can essentially kind of uh, move briefs around electronically online. So. I, again, am, am pretty optimistic that, that the profession as a whole has responded really well. The Law Society is also really pushing um, this. You may, may be aware of, you know, the FLIP conference that the New South Wales Law Society runs each year, which is all about technology in the industry. And that makes a huge difference because when, they're, when the regulators are the ones pushing the use of this type of software, because that's often been the reason the lawyers don't like touching certain areas, is that they feel like, well, you know, it hasn't been tried and tested. We're a very risk averse bunch. And so we don't like to do things that are outside of our comfort zone. But when the regulators and the, and the industry bodies are saying, hey, no, you can do this, that helps, helps a lot. So um, I, I think we're responding well, it's probably to, to quickly circle back to your original question. And, but also, I think one of the really interesting things with COVID has been the way in which it forced um, courts to have to change. And it'll be so interesting to see how that works because, you know, it's very difficult to imagine, um, you know, pre-COVID that courts would suddenly all go online and, and so forth. And, and it's obviously not always been easy. It's been a challenge. But all of that is really interesting, I think, as well, in terms of issues, again, around access to justice and access to legal 
services generally. So, you know, yeah. a lot of things really, um, I think we really have to make sure that when, as we come out of this, we, we reflect on, um, on what this does mean and how we can do things differently and smarter and so forth and, and what we've really learned from this. Yeah, I mean, um, online dispute resolution and media mediation, I think is going to be a huge area. You know, if, if someone was to say to me, what's going to happen in legal tech in the next five years, which may have already been a question you were about to ask me, um, online dispute resolution, I think is the number one area. You know, you look at, um, you look over in the US and, and a company like um, uh, Modria, which is eBay and PayPal's dispute resolution software, they, they settle 60 million disputes a year online. You know, no court comes close to that, right? So I think that um, what we'll see is that area really increase. Now, look, I'm not, I'm not saying that suddenly the, the top end, uh, the barristers and things need to look out that that's not, that's not gonna happen. What, what we'll see happen is like all industries, we see the disruption start at the bottom. It comes in and, and, it, and it hits the, the areas that aren't serviced by the profession at the moment. Um, you know, for example, an eBay dispute. You know, no, I'm guessing no lawyer is going to want to get involved in that for a $600 dispute. It's not even worth opening a file. But that being said, the consumer still needs a solution there. And the solution has been for someone from outside the industry to come in and solve that problem, being eBay in this case. So what we'll see is these models come in from the bottom and slowly rise up um, and come through the through the profession up, up the rungs. So, you know, LawPath is a quite a good example of that. What, you know, LawPath is not here to compete with mid tiers and top tiers. Um, that's not what we're here to do. We do provide commercial legal services, but, you know, I like to say we service what I call tiny law, which is underneath small law. And it's all those people out there in Australia that, that but for a service like LawPath, just wouldn't have engaged a lawyer. They just wouldn't have put any kind of protection in place. But what that's meant is that, you know, we service tiny law, we encroach in small law. It means that lawyers that are maybe running boutique practices are either forced to commoditize or specialize. They can't be stuck in the middle. So they commoditize by using more software and providing more commoditized like fixed price legal services like LawPath, or they specialize and move up the food chain a little bit. And when I say food chain, I don't mean it's better to be at the bottom or the top. I'm just kind of saying they move up and then they put pressure on the top tiers to provide, you know, better and, and cheaper services. So a question that really interests me as, as a law dean is, and, and when law students come in to law school, I think they're often thinking quite, they're still quite conservative about what a lawyer does and, and so forth. And of course we try and, you know, take them through and change their perception about that. And we do have quite an emphasis through our, legal futures and technology major on innovation and technology. Um, but one of the things that I think we still don't have a good picture of is what are those future roles for lawyers? So we still tend to think in terms of, well, there's the solicitor, there's the barrister, in-house counsel, if you like, different ways of being a solicitor, legal aid, big tier, etc. But it does seem to me that different roles will also be created. It's a little bit like, as you were talking before, about unbundling. And I wonder if you, and it's the one thing that I think we don't yet, or I don't feel we've yet got a really good handle on. And I wonder if you've got a sense in that sort of thinking forward, hmm. what might be the future types of roles that lawyers um, might be able to, might, might have. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good question. And, and, you know, a lot of, so we run two internship programs at, at law path um, and it comes up every time coming through the internship program, which is, you know, what, what will my job look like in five years time? I, I think there's also um, a lot of doom and gloom out there. You read the legal publications that says there's too many law students, there's too many lawyers, software's coming to eat our, um, eat our lunch. Um, it couldn't be a more exciting time to be a law student than right now. But you have to look at it through a bit of a different lens. And when I say that, you have to think a little bit outside the box. So, you know, I, I did the traditional path. I, I finished law school and I went to a clerkship at Minter Ellison and I wouldn't swap that for anything. That was fantastic. But 
the, you know, the grim reality is that there's only about 300 of those clerkships available. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of law students going for it. And I see a lot of students coming through and missing out on a clerkship and saying, well, well what do I do now? Um, and the answer is, well, there's so many other things you can do. And some of them might even be a better option for you than going to a traditional firm. So I think if you think outside the box a little bit, you understand that being a traditional commercial lawyer doesn't mean you have to go to a large firm and do a clerkship and work your way up. There are so many jobs on the periphery of law. You know, you might even choose to still work in the legal industry like myself. You know, I, I don't have a, well, I have a practicing certificate, but I don't use it anymore because I found a, 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 you know, a business related role that's still connected to law, but yeah, on that flow of unbundling of legal services, lawyers are just this small little bit in the middle and there's all these roles on the outside. One of the questions that always comes up is, do I need to know how to code? And um, the answer is no. And uh, look, you are a complete unicorn if you are a great lawyer and you're a great coder, but they are so rare that my answer and my thoughts on this is no, you don't need to know how to code. Um, you know, when I'm hiring, we have, you know, 15 or so, you know, software developers at LawPath. When I'm hiring, I'm not looking for the one that is a good lawyer and a good coder, because if they're a good lawyer and a good coder, well, they can't be good at both things. You know, I want to hire really good software developers to come and work in my legal business. And I want to work, hire really good lawyers to come and work in my legal business. Um, so, you know, this idea that you have to learn how to code, if you're doing a, a combined degree of, of computing and, and law, keep doing it. I'm not telling you to stop. But I think for all the lawyers out there who um, don't know that much about technology and are told, oh, well, you need to know how to code if you want to work for a legal tech co company, the answer is no. What you do need to know is just a, a basic level of understanding on, on how to speak to developers, on how to speak to non-lawyers. You know, a lot of the work that's done in these you know, companies like ours and, and similar are, are building legal products. And that, that involves legal knowledge and then being able to, to get that legal knowledge into some kind of product or software that a, that a software developer can build. So I think the roles that will kind of um, come out are, over, over the next five years, I have this idea that they'll be called legal analysts. And what a legal analyst, analyst will do is they... Um, they will be able to use all of the software that's made available to them and then present the results from that software to a client. So, you know, big data and, and analytics is becoming um, a bigger part of the legal industry. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of lawyers out there that don't know how to use that software. And so, you know, for example, we're starting to see e-discovery, you know, relativity specialists. So people that just focus on the software of rel relativity and they can charge as much as a lawyer would, but they are specialised in using that software and then and then being able to, to take that and either explain it to a lawyer or a client. So it's a little bit of a long-winded answer, but I'm a little bit passionate about this one. I think one, um, you've got to think outside the box a little bit if you're a law student um, around what you can do after law school. Two, um, you don't have to be an amazing coder if you want to work in legal technology. You just have to understand a little bit about software. And you can do that by working with online courses or you can go and, um, you know, do some study at, at night time. Um, and then the big one and the third one is, you know, you don't have to be a lawyer in the traditional sense of a lawyer. There's a lot of opportunities coming up in the profession. Um, and you may not be called a solicitor and you may not want to be called a solicitor. You might prefer to be called a technology, legal technology analyst or a legal engineer or, a, you know, I think techno legals is another one that gets thrown around. So um, there's, there's so many opportunities out there. Um, I think it's really a good time to be, um, to be coming into the profession. Um, that's great, Dominic. And, and I just, um, I think I agree with you entirely. It's an exciting area, but you've got to help You've got to create those opportunities for yourself as, as well. And, and I think those sort of future roles, instead of everybody fitting into a, a traditional kind of model of what is a lawyer and having to do all those things. So I think there's just huge opportunities around that. We need to um, allow time for questions, but I'm just going to finish off um, by asking you, you know, law paths been at the forefront. Um, technology, as you say, is taking hold. They're getting more positive. 
So where is law pass going to go? How do you see law pass developing um, and how will technology play a role in that? Yeah, well, um, we've got big plans. Um, you know, we estimate about 1.1.5% of Australians have used law pass so far. You know, my North Star is to get that to 10%. I want to be the, the go-to legal platform when you have a legal problem here in Australia. Um, and then up into Asia, that's the big plan for us. Um, in terms of what's going to happen to the product um, or the services, you know, I think technology will have a huge part to play. I, I don't think we can do a talk like this without mentioning the word AI. Um, you know, obviously it's going, um, you know, we, we use it in our business. I don't think it's, um, it's as widely spread as maybe people think um, in terms of, um, uh, how do I say this nicely? I, I think there's a lot of smoke and mirrors around the use of the word AI in legal right now. I, I, I don't think it's not going to be used in legal. I just think it's early stages. So, um, you know, for us, one of the, the things we're looking at is um, machine learning. So we, um, we've plugged in what's called Amazon Personalize, which is uh, Amazon's machine learning um, API into our LawPath platform. Uh, and essentially what that, that does is it looks at all the data that's already been um, anonymized, obviously, and put on the LawPath platform um, and looks at those users. And then when a new user comes through or client comes through our platform, um, it can match up all the actions taken by past clients and then suggest the next actions for that, for that client. So right there, what you're doing is, is almost replicating what would happen if a client went into a lawyer and said, I've just started a business what do I need to do for the next year to get my business to become successful? The lawyer is going to give them a laundry list of different things, get your employment agreements in place, get your trademark in place. Um, what we're trying to do is use that machine learning to then allow software to do that. And so I suppose in a little bit of a way, you know, we said that, that, um, that software is not going to replace lawyers. I think in that case, software will replace a small part of what a lawyer does. Uh, that being said, you know, I'm sure a lawyer doesn't want to sit there providing that advice every day. They would much prefer to do the more complex work when there's actually a real need. Mm -hmm. Big one for me um, over the next little while, and I think law in general um, or legal tech in general is I always, when I'm building something with the team at LawPath, I'm always thinking, how can we make law proactive? So law has always been reactive. When something goes wrong or you need something done, the last thing you do is you, you contact the lawyer. And you know, the reason for that is one, you know, they're going to cost you money or two, you don't really want to bring them in until the very end or when they're really needed. Um, and often that leads to more and more money being spent. How, or is there a way that we could make law more proactive, bring the cost down, bring the access up. And just like a large corporate has their lawyer on retainer and they're paying them 50,000 a month to answer any questions that might come up. Can we then use software and use a legal platform to provide that to everyone? Um, so that's my goal for, um, for, for LawPath over the next little while. Next, um, probably five years in terms of legal tech in general, I think, um, uh, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, the, the Australian Legal Tech Association. When we first created that association, we had about 10 members, I think. It's now up to 160 members. So there's all these new ideas coming through. Most of them are quite small businesses um, with, with big ideas. So I think we'll see all these new businesses coming through. As mentioned, I think um, online dispute resolution, massive area. Um, I think big data and, and analytics, another huge area. Um, and I think what we'll see is a continuing of, of this unbundling um, and a, the, a, a firm or, or a lawyer's success will be all around how they respond to that unbundling. If they hold on and continue to practice in the traditional ways under the traditional models, under the traditional billing cycles, I don't think they'll survive. They might survive for the next 10 years or 15 years, but in 50 years time, things will have changed. And what we've seen at LawPath anyway is the lawyers that are adapting um, are the ones that are becoming more and more successful. Mm. Okay, great. So we've got some questions here. And um, perhaps if we look first of all, a question from Julian Brophy. And, and we've talked a bit about access to legal services today, but I think his question is around um, if a byproduct of LawPath has been to increase top legal services, where do we where do you see that going in the future and, and in particular the increasing equitable access to law 
Yeah. So just so I've got this question 100% right, you know, we've seen law path affect kind of large businesses um, or business of what I again call up, up the food chain a little bit, but uh, we're talking about more access to justice and, and those businesses. I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I have a, a pretty strong opinion on this actually. So, um, you know, what I've, I've seen and experienced um, over the last five years is there are a lot of amazing pieces of software and ideas come out purely targeted at non-for-profit access to justice, kind of free, free legal type services. But what we're seeing is that um, the, you know, and they can be funded by government or non-for-profit organizations, but that funding only goes so far. Mm -hmm. So what I really believe is that the software needs to be created with a commercial purpose to start with. And then the benefits of that software can go up into and put pressure on traditional legal services, but also debt. Again, I'm kind of using this up and down mythology. I don't mean it in that exact way, but, but down to um, access to justice and, and free legal services. And I'll give you a really, really great example of that. So last year, LawPath built with IBM Watson. Um, IBM Watson is their AI platform. We built some software that, um, that essentially um, could look at a, at a conversation through a chat bot and then run that, that conversation against legislation and then provide some kind of outcome um, or intent off that legislation. So um, we were using it um, around, um, tell us what your legal need is in terms of legal documentation, and we'll look at the legislation and tell you what kind of employment agreement or, or, or what you needed. What actually ended, happening, what ended up happening was, um, as a bit of a test, some of our interns at LawPath who most of them were actually UTS interns, um, they, um, they ran that, they used that same piece of software and they ran it against domestic violence legislation. And they found that um, a user could have a, a natural language conversation through Facebook with this AI bot. And essentially it would run it against the, the domestic violence legislation and tell you whether it thought domestic violence was present. And then it would direct the user or the client to a, to a drop-in center. And so, my kind of point there is we built it for a commercial reason, but it flowed down into another reason. So to kind of, Julian, to answer your questions, I really believe that um, what we're seeing is that the, for the software to be built and there needs to be a commercial purpose, and then the onflows of that will affect not only the traditional legal services, but access to justice and, and free legal services as well. Mm. Um, that's great. And um, Paul Nolan has asked you, uh, do you, and, and you talk, we've talked a little bit to some extent of this, but, but where, where I suppose does the bar fit in, in all of this and, and, and in what capacity or, or how are they going to fit into this sort of future environment? Yeah, so I, I will kind of confess I'm, I'm not an expert on this specific area. So, um, Paul, um, forgive me if I, if I say something incorrect, but what I... What I'm seeing is, you know, I think the bar are very much playing the same or a similar role to the law societies and regulators, which is right now there's no software, especially well, there's limited software in Australia that's having a direct impact on, on the bar. I mean, obviously there's barristers using iPads and there's e-briefs and things like that, but there's no, um, there's no kind of major software, but we're definitely seeing um, kind of encouragement from the bar to use more software. And I think a perfect example of this is e-discovery where, you know, firms are, are forced to use e-discovery software. Um, that's a huge step forward. You know, instead of a room of, of paralegals going through documents for, for hundreds of hours, um, a software like Relativity or, or Ringtail can be used um, to cut the costs. So I think that kind, those kind of actions will make a big difference and actually starting to say no, saying to the profession, no, you know, th th this, this software has been approved. These, these processes have been approved. We encourage you now to use them and we even now, you, you must use them. Mm, absolutely. I have to say, I think one of the lowest points of my legal career was spending weeks in a very huge warehouse somewhere in England, I forget, um, <laughs> going through documents. It was um, not fun. <laughs> yeah, um, we've all been there, I think. Yeah, that's right. Um, and another question, how long uh, do you think it would take a new firm 
to accumulate enough client matters to help populate something like Amazon Personalized to achieve maximum use? Oh, good technical question. I love it. Um, so um, the answer is not what you're going to like. I don't have a definitive number, but the what we found with with um, IBM Watson and with Amazon Personalized is, um, you know, a hundred pieces of data will give you a result. So, for example, I'm going to go pretty technical right here, but in terms of Amazon Personalized, essentially what it allows you to do is you put in your product catalog of what so what um, clauses and what products previous users have used. And then when a new user comes through the system, it looks at all the attributes, it matches them up with the, the previous clients and it says, okay, we think you should use these, docu these documents, these clauses and these products. And with a hundred pieces of data, we got results, but they were bad results. So with IBM Watson, it wasn't until we had two or 3,000 users through the system that we actually started to see, um, you know, proper, proper results and results that could be, that weren't wrong. Because with all these systems, you have to train it, essentially. You, you put the data in and then you go through and you say, yes, no, wrong, right, until it learns itself. But that takes a while. So um, I'll probably just, I'm going to talk about one more thing because this is another kind of thing I've been thinking about a lot recently around who's got enough data to make this data analytics and to make this AI work well. Because until it works well, no lawyer is ever going to use it. Until it works 100% of the time, no lawyer is ever going to risk using, using the software. Or if they use it, like a lot of them do now, they get a lawyer to check it when the results come out of the, the black box. Um, and for regulation reasons, you have to do that as well. So, you know, I believe that it'll be the, the aggregators. And so, you know, I look at companies like LexisNexis and Thomson Reuters, you know, they're not, they're not publishing companies anymore. They're data companies. And they've been going around for the last five years, buying up legal software companies. And now they have a big enough user base and a big and big enough pieces of software that they've got enough data to properly use these. And a really good example of that is something like Ravel or Lex Machina over in the U S that was bought by LexisNexis. Um, They've now got enough data to actually take those pieces of software to full capacity and, and, and make them right. So again, long-winded answer, um, uh, you know, quick answer to the question is you can get some, uh, some pretty good um, results pretty quickly, but they're not right. <laughs> it takes a while to get them right. Yeah. And, and I think that also goes back to your point about it's not about lawyers needing to code, but lawyers need to understand what is happening in these these processes so that they, and that's, you know, in a sense, part of their role as lawyers is being able to bring that judgment to that sort of question as well. And then, you know, where the machine learning is not sort of, you know, um, working with the right data and, 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 mm. and so forth. Yeah. I, yeah. I know we've got to wrap up. I think that's a really important um, thing to, and for, especially for students to think about you know using AI we don't know how the AI got to that answer yeah. therefore can we as lawyers say the legal advice is correct mm. probably a conversation for another time because I know we're almost short but oh and there's so much so much um, conversation that we could continue happening having around this but it, it is I think um, really really fascinating and I think that's the interesting point about where we are at the moment you know it's as you say it's only really been five years, it's starting. But I think we're getting a more nuanced understanding. It's not technology as a destroyer. It's not technology um, as, as, the, as the negative or technology can do everything. It is that we actually, we have to understand, if we really want to work with it, we have to understand how it does work mm -hmm. and, and what we need to make it work and what we need to do. So it's a really, you know, interesting time in that sense, I think. Um, for lawyers, um, but we must wrap up. Otherwise, we'll, we'll they'll just cut us off. I think. <laughs> um, but look, um, thank you so much. That was just such a rich um, discussion, and and I'd just love to keep talking to you about that. And um, it's really interesting work, and it's it's great that what you do bring to it. I think is such a such a really thoughtful. Um, uh, thoughtful approach um, and it shows how embedded you are in the area and I think how committed you are as well because you're 
you are really thinking about, well, what does this mean for the future? What does it mean in how we can deliver, deliver good services? Um, I really, you know, I thought your discussion around what those future roles might be, et cetera, and, and the proactive role that we can be playing. And you're right, we're so often reactive. But mm -hmm. I think lawyers are being asked to, you know, fill a different kind of space now as well in their relationship with clients and, and how they develop their profession and so forth. So thank you so much. It was um, just really tremendous discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, the audience has, has, um, has enjoyed that as well. Um, so I, I will just um, formally close now. And, and as, I've, as we said, this webinar is, is part of the UTS Illuminated webinar series where you can engage insights from our 2020 game-changing um, alumni. And as you'll see on the screen now, the next webinar in this uh, is this Thursday with Associate Professor Lulu Zalapata, Zalapa, sorry, um, our 2020 health recipient. And for more information, please see our website, which is alumni, dot uts dot edu dot au um, thank you to everyone for joining us and we look forward to hosting you at our next virtual event thank you again goodbye thank you bye mm -hmm.